Every group of people has certain banned words or phrases, and if you want to navigate these groups unharmed, you'd best not say them. Just like in Brooklyn, you shouldn't say the N-word. If you're among gamers, you shouldn't use the phrase, that's not a roguelike. The phrase, that's not a roguelike, is the N-word for gamers. What a fucking- That's not a roguelike. Say it in the wrong crowd, and you're gonna be lynched. 69 people died last year from roguelike-related crimes, and please don't chuckle at the funny haha sex number, people died. Real people. Is it possible this story is true? Yes, it is. But I can't help myself anymore. I'm constantly getting comments on old Let's Plays from people telling me I don't know what a roguelike is. And if you're gonna sit there and tell me that I don't know what a roguelike is, well, sorry, you've just activated my trap card. Trap Hole. Not named that because of whatever gay shit you were thinking of, <laughs> but because I will now drag you down into my roguelike rabbit hole and rant at you about what makes a roguelike while you slowly starve to death. Before we get into the nitty gritty, we need to establish some things. Because no matter how much work I put into defining a genre, I know there'll be some objections that attempt to completely undermine my arguments. So first of all, let's get this out of the way. But Michael, genres are subjective. There's no point arguing about them. LIAR! Okay, I see we're living in the burn stain world line. All right, genres are subjective. Dark Souls is a grand strategy game, and my favorite visual novel is chess. Does that sound ridiculous? Yep. Because it is ridiculous. You can argue that genres are more or less objective, but I think we can all agree that they're like at least like, like a little bit objective, right? Like platformers have platforms objectively. And if we're gonna talk about this genre and talk about it with some degree of objectivity, we need to establish our standards. A genre is a category of art with agreed upon conventions. They allow us to categorize and to compare. This makes them incredibly practical. As long as they're not so vague, they don't tell you anything. For instance, if you loved Final Fantasy VII and you want to play more games like Final Fantasy VII, I would tell you to check out other turn-based RPGs because they'll share a lot of the same conventions that Final Fantasy VII has and are therefore somewhat similar games. On top of that, if you want to talk about which games are the best, it wouldn't be very fair to compare things from different genres. Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door might be the greatest RPG ever made, it is, but if you say that Minecraft is better, it is. I respect that. But it really isn't fair to compare the two. I can argue that Paper Mario is better than Final Fantasy VII because they're both turn-based RPGs, but saying it's better than Minecraft is gonna be hard because they're so different. It might be better or worse at different things, and those things are gonna matter more or less to you as an individual, and they're gonna matter more or less depending on what the genre is, but we're comparing apples and oranges. Genres allow us to compare apples to apples. Another important point, though, is that genres must be different from each other. The more overlap there is, the more vague the definition is, the less practical the definition becomes. For instance, some people have taken to using an extremely vague definition of the term RPG, claiming that any game where you roleplay a character is a role-playing game. That makes sense! except that it means that anything from ray play to playing chess while pretending you're the king is an RPG. If I tell you that I enjoyed Lisa, and you tell me I should play another great RPG, Mario Kart Double Dash, I'm going to fucking lose it! Or here's another slightly more controversial comparison. If I enjoyed The Binding of Isaac, and then you tell me I should play FTL, because they're both roguelikes, then either the term roguelike is so fucking vague that it is useless because these incredibly different games both fall into the genre, or you're misusing the term roguelike. Because either roguelikes are, in fact, too vague, in which case I will take my place as the great roguelike reformer, or, more likely, roguelikes are misunderstood, and I will take my place as some fucking douchebag ranting about definitions. Alright, finally, it is now time to get into roguelikes. And it is also time for perhaps the hottest take of this entire video. Believe it or not, I'm not the only person out there who's autistic 
about roguelikes. And in 2008, a number of my brethren came together in an international roguelike conference in Berlin. And there, they created the Berlin interpretation, their definition of a roguelike, and the golden standard for roguelikes used and defended by all die-hard roguelike fans. And it's fucking terrible. The Berlin interpretation is so fucking convoluted that trying to summarize it here is actually kind of difficult. But basically, it's a list of various factors that might make something a roguelike. Certain high-value factors and certain low-value factors. For instance, permadeath, random generation, and even complexity and resource management are high value factors. One would be led to believe that all of these high value factors are equal. So therefore a turn-based game with permadeath is just as much of a roguelike as StarCraft II, a game which has complexity and resource management, both high value factors. By the interpretation's own admission, quote, this list can be used to determine how roguelike a game is. Missing some points, does not mean the game is not a roguelike. Likewise, possessing some points does not mean the game is a roguelike. What? You heard that right. They turned roguelike into both an adjective and a sliding scale, like autism. There are more pieces of this definition that could be torn apart, but I don't see the point, because this is not a definition. Could you imagine if first-person shooters existed on a sliding scale where certain high-value factors, such as a first-person camera made the game more or less of a first-person shooter. And could you then further imagine that this scale had the absolute gall to claim that parts of the definition could be missing, such as a first-person perspective, and yet it would not necessarily mean it isn't a first-person shooter. It's fucking ludicrous. And this right here is one major reason why I can't blame a single person for being confused about what a roguelike is. So we need to do better. We need a definition that encompasses all the games that are traditionally accepted as roguelikes, but is also specific enough as to not include almost all games ever made. Fuck that vague shit. We need specifics. Going back to the FPS genre, which is incredibly clear. It's clear what the genre is, because it gets right down to the basics. What is shared between all games of that genre? And nothing else. All FPS games have a first-person camera and shooting of some sort of projectile. There's a lot of variety within the genre, and you can get more specific, you can get little micro-genres, but let's not go down that rabbit hole. But so that is the essence of an FPS. So the question now is what is the essence of a roguelike? Just like an FPS, or an RTS. I think the easiest way is just to play them. You figure it out pretty fucking fast. But even looking at them can tell you a lot. So here's some footage of some of the most influential roguelikes, some of the ones on the Rogue Basin list of major roguelikes, as well as some of the most popular roguelikes. What do they all have in common? They are top-down, grid-based, with movement that is turn-based, but simultaneous. In other words, nothing in the world moves until you move, and then it moves at the same time. They have stats, they have items, and they have procedural generation of at least some of the world. That is my definition. I cannot think of or find a single roguelike that does not have these elements, but I also can't think of or find any other element that they all share. But wait a sec, Michael, I thought any game with permadeath was a roguelike. <laughs> Wrong! I, I lied earlier. This is the hottest take of the video. Permadeath does not make something a roguelike, and it's extremely easy to demonstrate that. If you play Super Mario Bros. with only one life, is it now a roguelike? No, it's still a platformer, just a harder one. The genre isn't any different, the game just became harder. Whoa, but wait a whoa. second, Michael, I, I can accept that. Okay, permadeath isn't the only thing that makes a roguelike, but isn't it a part of the definition of a roguelike? Don't all roguelikes? have permadeath? Actually, no. There are some controversial games I could bring up here, but I'm gonna play it safe on this one and bring up one of the major roguelikes I mentioned earlier. Major roguelikes are the games that are seen by the autistic roguelike community as very influential and important. The roguelikes that define the genre. This game that I'm talking about is one of those.
Tales of Majayal, or Tome, is a roguelike. It is accepted as a roguelike by even the most autistic of roguelike fans, myself included. No other genre describes it as accurately as roguelike does, and it meets my minimal definition at the very least. But the permadeath is optional. When you make a character in Tome, you are asked whether or not you want permadeath to be on. Nothing else changes. Just what happens when you die. Does the setting determine what genre the game is? Turn it on, and it's a roguelike. Turn it off, and it's... what? What describes it better than a roguelike? It's exactly the same game, minus one small mechanical difference. Small because you could play the entire game and not notice that you accidentally set it to the wrong setting. You could think you're playing in permadeath, accidentally turn permadeath off, play the whole game, and not notice until you die. Are you telling me that a mechanic that you can possibly not notice changes the genre? If you started playing an FPS but you accidentally switched to third person mode, you would notice that changes the genre fundamentally. If you change a roguelike to a roguelike without permadeath on accident, you won't notice because permadeath isn't required to make a roguelike. Some men just want to watch them. And it isn't the only example. This isn't some fluke Ilona, a game that most autists will include in their roguelike general threads. It also has optional permadeath. And again, I ask, what genre describes these games more accurately? Because if they're not roguelikes, then what the fuck are they? Well, maybe these games are just RPGs then. Well, okay, let's go down that rabbit hole then, why don't we? Well, they're not real-time RPGs, that's obvious, but they're not turn-based RPGs either, since these games don't have turns the same way turn-based RPGs do. Because this isn't a I move, then you move chess-based system, it's a nothing moves until I move, and then everything moves at once system, like real life. No other genre is like that, and everything inside the genre shares this quality, which sounds like a pretty practical definition to me. Tome and Alona fit very well into this definition because they have that kind of movement. The kind of movement that no other genre does. I, well, with very, very minor exceptions. Super Hot is not a roguelike because it's not grid based and it's not. Okay. But Michael, doesn't this mean that Pokemon Mystery Dungeon is therefore a roguelike? Yes! Yes! Obviously! Why is this so hard for P? Yes! Pokemon Mystery Dungeon is a roguelike! Mystery Dungeon games are roguelikes. That is perfectly reasonable to me. If I recommended Tome to a Mystery Dungeon fan, then as long as I warned them that it's a much harder game and you're not going to cry at the end of it like Pokemon, I think that's a fine recommendation. Practically, they are in the same genre. Perfect. So, let me know what you think of this definition. I am I am not the king of roguelikes or some shit. I'm just some guy who grew up playing them because my parents did meth. Now, before we wrap things up, I do need to mention this because I know that every single comment would point this out. It, they might already be there if I don't mention this. During this entire video, I have not mentioned the game Rogue. The game for which this entire genre that we spent this past 20 minutes talking about is named after. This may have seemed like a bit of an oversight. How could he not talk about Rogue in his roguelike video? It's not an oversight. Part of the confusion of the genre is that the name implies just being similar to Rogue. And you can argue that just about fucking anything is similar to Rogue. Real life could be called a roguelike, because like Rogue, it's pretty fucking boring compared to the alternatives. The only options I see to fix this confusion are either to change the name of the genre, or just use the same name, but a clearer definition. I think the first option would be even more confusing, so here we are. If you disagree, and you think we should change the name, please call them Yeoman Likes, so that I can become famous. Okay, bye. Hey, wait, before you go, big news, uh, Yeoman has started a Patreon. <laughs> We both um, are wage slaves. We work full time, so it's hard to get this stuff out. Uh, so if you want to see more of this stuff, consider consider going to, to the Patreon. I'm the editor, by the way. I'm the edit bitch, Dalton. So here's the thing about the Patreon: we give you stuff in return, real good stuff too. So at one dollars a month, 
you get uh, your name in the credits, and that's cool. Everyone does that, and we appreciate it. Definitely, that's awesome. But at three dollars a month, uh, you get access to the exclusive Shekel Saloon there in the Discord, where you get sneak peeks to stuff. Uh, you get a cool pink name in the Discord. It's just cool. At five dollars, you get access to a special voice chat server during upcoming movie nights. You get to verbally shitpost over everyone's movie experience, ruining it for everybody. In the past, we watched Falling Down, we watched Red Line, we watched Serial Experiments Lane, all kinds of stuff. You don't want to miss that. At ten dollars a month, you get to play, and this is this is the coolest one, by the way. You get to play video games live on stream with Michaels. Uh, grand strategy games, we got CK2, Vicky2, stuff people have been asking for for a long time. You get to play that live with Yeoman himself. So go go check that out. Go check out his Patreon. We got a link down there in the description. At $501 a month, uh, Michael says he's going to start paying me. Um, I don't want to make you feel better or anything, but uh, I, my wife is pregnant and I'm very poor. So uh, pl uh, please, please go donate. Thanks. Thanks for watching the video. Hope you liked it.